Hope Mission Earth webinars, uh, number nine of this year. And I'll just share like a PowerPoint here. Let's see, get ourselves started. All right. Okay, so today uh, we're going to be doing. Oh, yes, yeah, so if everybody can mute. Okay, so uh, our webinar today is about climate communications, and it's by uh, Susan Joy Hassal. I don't know if I said your name right, <laughs> Susan, <laughs> but um, let's see. Oh. Just want to say that you know this is our project, Globe Mission Earth. It's a partnership between University of Toledo, Boston University, West Ed, and UC Berkeley, uh, Tennessee State, and NASA Langley. And of course, the GLOBE program. So we're bringing together the GLOBE with NASA assets. It's funded by NASA. And getting kids to do projects, uh, engaging the public and, and K to 16, all those great things. Uh, and I'll talk about that, the student follow-up in a little bit. So we'll turn it over to Susan. Actually, you're going to turn it over to me real quick here, Kevin. Oh, that's right, Tracy. That's all right. See, no problem. We no already problem. We, we talked about that. We did just a few hours ago, Kevin. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, well, thanks for for being here, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Tracy Ostrom from uh, the Globe Partnership out west, and uh, you're going to hear some some really great ideas about uh, client communications and communication strategies in general from Susan um, in just a minute. But I wanted to give a little bit of background. Uh, Susan is on the East Coast, I believe, North Carolina, and I'm here in, in California. And you're probably going, how in the heck did, uh, did these two guys meet? And uh, Susan and I met at the most recent um, AGU conference in December of last year and I found out she I was presenting a, uh, I was doing a poster presentation and um, Susan stopped by because she saw the globe symbol on my poster and we had a great conversation uh, Susan has some history with globe um, and its early inception and uh, I just uh, I'm very grateful to uh, as we were talking I was very uh, really interested in her work in the communication mode um, and her organization, which she has here, uh, as she's sharing her screen, climatecommunication.org. So I'm going to actually turn it over to Susan uh, now and say thank you very much for, for uh, being our speaker tonight and uh, really super interested in hearing uh, all, the, all the good things that you're doing and, and some ways in which we can help our teachers and our students uh, in this area of communicating our thoughts and ideas on uh, climate. So thank you so Great. much for being here, Susan. My pleasure. Can you hear me okay now? Yep. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Kevin. It's really great to be here with you all. As, as Tracy mentioned, I have a little bit of history with the very beginnings of the GLOBE program. It must have been about 20 years ago when things were just getting started, and I was involved with advising and help writing some of the initial protocols and uh, information for teachers so it's really exciting for me to see how globe has grown and developed and i'm so glad that you all are are doing this so i want to talk to you maybe i should just say a couple of words about myself and my history because i've been working in climate change communication for about 30 years and i started off trying to help scientists to just translate science into english and communicate more effectively but what I found was there was so much more to it than just teaching them not to use jargon. It was how to be a better storyteller and all kinds of other things. And also to learn something about the psychology of people and the public and students and all kinds of things. So um, I've testified before Congress, I've written an HBO documentary, I've done all kinds of uh, reports, uh, was the writer on all three of the national climate assessments that have been written and the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. So I've done a, a whole range of things. And um, what I want to talk to you about tonight is telling the climate change story. And the first thing that I think is really important to say is that 
this is not just a story about the environment or saving the earth. So often we talk about climate change that way. It's about saving the planet. And when you ask Americans, what's the first thing they think of when they think of climate change? They think of melting ice at the poles and polar bears. And of course we all know that it's so much more than that. This is a story about people. It's about our economy and our health, our food, our water, our way of life. And I think it's so important to make that point because you know most Americans don't consider themselves environmentalists. And if we make this an environmental issue, then it's not their issue. So I think it's really important that we make that, you know, make that very clear that this is about everything. Now, I should say that personally, I think that there shouldn't be such a strong dichotomy in this, this break between the environment and the economy and people. Because to me, you know, as Gaylord Nelson, the, the co-founder of Earth Day said, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. So without a healthy, strong environment, you don't have a good economy. So to me, they're not so separate. Yet for many people, they are. And so I think it's very important that we don't just classify climate change as an environmental issue. So what I want to talk about, I'm going to give you a few of my tips for good communication, and particularly about climate change, but about communication in general. My colleague Ed Maybach likes to say that the secret of good communication is simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted sources. And I think that's good advice. So I wanted to start with that. Another thing I wanted to, to make clear is that we sometimes do a core dump about everything we know, and that doesn't work very well. That in many cases, the more you say, the less people hear. And so I'm reminded sometimes of, you know, I'll be in a hotel room and I'll want to turn on the television and just watch a little news. And I pick up the remote, and it looks like this. Don't be like this. Don't give people so much information that they can't figure out what's important. They can't figure out the one thing they really need and want to know. So this is just a reminder for you of what not to do. Now, I'm a firm believer that the words we use, the language that we choose, really makes a difference in how we communicate and how we reach people. So I wanted to give you just a few examples of how I think words really matter. I often hear people say, yep, the world's warming and we're to blame. It's our fault. And I think, ouch, as soon as I hear those words blame and fault, people recoil. They get in a defensive posture and it almost makes them want to say, no, it's not. I didn't do it on purpose, right? It's not my fault. And so I prefer to use the word responsibility. I say human activity is the cause and we're responsible, right? Because that's the kind of people we are. We take responsibility for our actions. I think that's just a better choice of word. Um, somebody might be off mute now. I just heard some noise. Okay, and so another, another thing I often hear people talk about is the inevitability. You know, oh, no matter what we do, we're going to see more warming. Well, of course, we all know that there's a certain amount of additional warming in the pipeline. Naturally, we know that. However, I think it's better to talk about the choices that we face. We face a choice between a future with less climate change and a future with more climate change. So we face a choice, and there's an urgency to the action. Because the longer we continue on the current path that we're on, the more of, this, more of these problems we're going to face. So rather than talking about inevitability, I prefer to talk about the choice we face and the urgency we face. Often we hear people talk about belief in climate change. Do you believe in climate change? And this always drives me crazy because, of course, it's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of evidence and fact. So I don't use that word. And you know, as Neil deGrasse Tyson likes to say, the good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. So another way that I think words really matter is there are whole, this is one of the things that I've sort of become famous for among my colleagues. I discovered this, this notion that there are a lot of words that scientists use that the public also uses. They just use them to mean entirely different things. And so I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of this because I think we have to be careful about these words that mean different things to the public than they do to scientists. Now, an obvious one is the word aerosol, right? Scientists use the word aerosol. They're talking about tiny particles. 
but to the public, an aerosol is a spray can, and that's what it's always going to be. So in this picture you can see on your screen, that's Rush Limbaugh. He is doing his part for global warming by spraying aerosols on the globe because he heard scientists say aerosols cool the climate. So of course what the scientists were talking about were the sulfate aerosols, the sulfate particles. So just a reminder that there are all these words that have these different meanings. Another one, of course, in, in climate change is positive feedback. To the public, that's going to be a good thing, right? They do a good job, they get positive feedback. But of course, what scientists are referring to is a vicious cycle in the climate system, whereby warming causes even more warming, and it self-reinforces. So I try and say, just use the term vicious cycle. That will be helpful. Now, of course, with your students, you're going to explain what feedbacks are, but we just have this problem with the word positive always meaning good and negative meaning bad, right? So a positive trend in temperature sounds like a good thing, right? But it's not. It's an upward trend. So in an article that I published with my colleague Richard Somerville in Physics Today, we put a whole bunch of these terms. And you can download this article at my website, climatecommunication.org. So you don't need to try and read all this or write it down. Just go to climatecommunication.org. And under resources and articles, you can find this Physics Today piece that has this table, has some scientific terms with their public meaning and better choices. Now, you may notice that one of the words on this is theory. Right, so scientists, of course, use the term theory to mean something that's very well established in science and can be used to make predictions, like the theory of gravity. But to the public, a theory is just a hunch or a guess, it's just some theory. So when people talk, the public talks sometimes about global warming, they'll say, oh, well, that's just a theory. And when I hear that, I always want to say, you know, gravity, that's just a theory too. <laughs> I did a TEDx talk, by the way, I used this and some other kind of amusing tidbits in that, in that TEDx talk, which you can also find at my website, climatecommunication.org, if you want a little, little more of history uh, of what I've been doing and a little more entertainment, you can check that out. So I wanted to talk a little bit about metaphors, because metaphors are such a powerful way to help us communicate about climate or about anything. So I like to say, that the heat trapping gases, the greenhouse gases, are like steroids in the climate system. And so just like a ball player, before he started taking steroids, he still hit home runs. But after he started using the steroids, he hit more home runs and he hit them farther. So sure, we've always had extreme weather events. We've always had heat waves. We've always had strong hurricanes, right? We've had heavy downpours, but now we're having more of those things and they're stronger. The heat waves are hotter, they come more frequently, they last longer, the rain comes in heavier downpours because we've put the climate system on steroids. I think when people hear that, it helps them to understand that what we're talking about is a change in the statistics, right? That's how it works with the steroids for the ball players or the bike racers, and that's how it works in the climate system. We're changing the statistics of weather. And so I think that's a powerful metaphor. Another one is the notion of fingerprints. Right? People sometimes ask, how do we know this warming is due to human activity? How do we know it's not just natural? And it's because the warming we're seeing has the fingerprints of human activity. And one of the examples I often give is the vertical pattern of temperature change through the layers of the atmosphere. Right? If, for example, the warming were happening because the sun were getting hotter, first of all, of course, we know it's not because we measure that, and there's not an more solar energy reaching the top of Earth's atmosphere. But another way we know is the pattern, vertical pattern of temperature change in the layers of the atmosphere. If it were the sun getting hotter, we'd see warming at the surface, in the troposphere, and in the stratosphere. But what we see is warming at the surface, warming in the troposphere, and cooling in the stratosphere. So that's a fingerprint, a human fingerprint. And so I, I find this to be a helpful metaphor when we're talking about climate change. So I mentioned this idea that people say, how do we know the warming's not natural? Climate has always changed in the past. So what I say is, you know, just because lightning strikes have long caused forest fires does not mean that fires can't also be caused by a careless camper. 
And when they hear that analogy, it helps them wrap their minds around the notion that sure, just because something has happened naturally in the past, doesn't mean that's the reason it's happening now. And we have all this evidence that the warming we're seeing now is due to human activity. That's where we come back to the fingerprints. So some other metaphors that I find very powerful around climate change are medical metaphors. So fever is important in, in determining your state of health, but it's not the whole story. So, you know, at your checkup, you don't confine yourself to talking about body temperature when you're discussing your health. Also, we know that in, in our health, prevention is better than cure. And the same with climate change. The more we can prevent, the less we'll have to deal with later. And also, if your doctor were to say to you, you need to eat better and get more exercise or you're headed for a heart attack, you would not insist that she tell you exactly when you were going to have that heart attack and exactly how bad it was going to be. No, you'd take her advice and you'd clean up your act. So this is what we have to think about with regard to climate change. We have the general picture. We don't have every single detail. And we don't expect that in any other aspect of, of our lives. So why should we expect that from climate science? You know, and also with some other health matters like quitting smoking, the challenge comes now and the payoff comes later. But it's, you know, I find that this is a whole set of medical metaphors that can be very useful. My colleague Richard Somerville wrote a very nice piece in Climatic Change where he elaborated on many of these medical metaphors. And you can download that at my website as well, climatecommunication.org. So I want to say a few more words about storytelling. Um, these are a few, few of my favorite books on the subject of storytelling. So from the, from the left to right, we'll start with the most general and then go to the most specific. So this book, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath, is a wonderful book that includes a lot of great tips about how to create good stories. And it's for any subject. The one in the middle, Houston, We Have a Narrative, is by Randy Olson. He's a scientist who became a filmmaker. And this one is about why science needs story. And he lays out his, um, his ideas, his theories, as it were, of what makes for good storytelling. And then finally is a wonderful recent book by my colleague, Per Espen Stokness, called What We Think About When We Try Not to Think About Global Warming. And he talks a lot about the storytelling that he thinks we should be doing that's a better set of stories. It's less about catastrophe and more about the positive future that we can all build together. And I'm a firm believer in that. So one of the tips that I like to tell you for storytelling is the power of three. Three things, right? People can remember three things. There's a pattern recognition, and here are a few examples, right? Stop, drop, and roll, guns, germs, and steel. Here are a bunch more if you don't believe me. Blood, sweat, and tears. Faith, hope, and charity, right? Things that come in threes are very helpful in terms of framing our stories and our narratives. So as an example, I'm gonna try and quickly tell you the story of climate change in three words. Simple, serious, and solvable. And I'm gonna give thanks here to Scott Denning. He's a climate scientist at Colorado State. And he came up with these three words, this framing. Now, I'm not going to tell the story the same way he does, and I'm not going to use his slides, but if you want them, you can find his slides online. Just Google Scott Denning, climate change, simple, serious, and solvable, and you will, can get his whole slide set. But I'm going to try just a quick run through of why I say climate change is simple, serious, and solvable. So let's start with simple, right? Heat trapping gases, not surprisingly, they trap heat. So carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, these exist in our atmosphere. They trap heat. That makes it hotter. We've increased the quantity, the concentration of these gases in our atmosphere, and that has warmed up the earth. That's really simple science, and that's the basis of this whole problem. And we have known about this since the 1800s. So as Scott Denning likes to say, this isn't rocket science, it's steam engine science. So you all know the history, and if you like to infuse your science lessons with some of the history of science, as you know, it's a fascinating story. You know, beginning with Fourier, hypothesizing that there were these heat-trapping gases in our atmosphere, and then going to Tyndall in the 1850s, building a machine that could actually tell how much each of these gases trapped. 
and then going to Arrhenius, because at that time we were already burning coal. And he said, well, if we, if we keep burning coal, we're going to heat up the atmosphere. And if we double, and he actually did a calculation using nothing more than a pen and paper to figure out how much the world would warm if we doubled pre-industrial carbon dioxide concentrations. And you know what? He nailed it. He figured out pretty much what we still know is the climate sensitivity, the amount of warming we get with a doubling of pre-industrial CO2. And there were no computers back then. So this is why I say it's pretty simple. Of course, we know the climate system is complex and there are all kinds of other complexities, but the basics, pretty straightforward. We know where these gases come from, carbon dioxide coming mostly from burning coal and natural gas in power plants, from using uh, gasoline in our cars and our planes, from clearing of forests. We know where the methane comes from. We know where the nitrous oxide comes from. And not surprisingly, we know that the CO2 has increased. We started measuring it in the 1950s, and we know that it's now almost 410 parts per million. We also know that when we look back at the long history of climate from ice cores, that we know that for like a million years, it never went above 300 parts per million, and now we're over 400 parts per million. And so let's take a look at the global temperature record, right? Heat trapping gases trap heat, and we've seen the warming, very clear warming trend with the three hottest years on record being the last three years. And even if we didn't have thermometers, we'd know it was warming because we've got Arctic sea ice melting, we've got Greenland and Antarctica melting, we've got less snowpack, we've got more moisture in the atmosphere, and we've got all kinds of other things that tell us that the world is warming. So it's pretty straightforward science, and based on the evidence, 97% of climate scientists have concluded that human-caused climate change is happening. So I've shown you how it's simple. Now let's talk about how it's serious. It's happening now. You know, we used to think of this as a problem for the future, but it's happening now in our own backyards. We're seeing some longer, deeper droughts. We're also seeing heavier downpours that can lead to flooding. We're seeing an increase in wildfires, both the number, the size, uh, longer fire season, and are related to climate change. Now, even the things that are not happening in our own even the things that are not happening in our own backyard have an effect on our own backyard. So this is a picture taken on the Greenland ice sheet. It was taken by a colleague, Conrad Steffen. And you know, I always say that the Arctic is not like Las Vegas. What happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. So this melting on Greenland, it's adding water to the oceans, and that's raising sea level. And as you know, sea level is also rising because of thermal expansion. Water, as it gets warmer, takes up more space, and the ocean rises. So for both of those reasons, the thermal expansion and the melting of land-based ice, we're seeing sea level rise. So this is some nice NASA data from GRACE observations. The green line, conveniently, is Greenland. The blue line is Antarctica. And we see a loss of mass on both of those big ice sheets. That's adding water to the oceans. And that's causing sea level to rise. And we've actually seen an acceleration in sea level rise in recent years. So we know this is serious. We know it has an effect on us because it means water in the streets of our coastal cities, particularly during big storms. These were during Sandy in New York. And here's water in the streets of Miami on a clear blue sky day. So this is not from storm surge, and it's not from uh, a heavy downpour. It's simply sea level rise at high tide. And they're seeing this in Miami, and it's causing quite an increase in this kind of flooding. You know, they call it nuisance flooding, and that really bothers me. It's one of those words that means different things. It's more than a nuisance when it's water in the street and it's hurting business and the economy and they're spending over $300 million on pumps to get that water out of the streets, that's more than a nuisance. So I don't like that term. So far I haven't been able to convince people to change it though. So New York, Miami, and Houston, we have a problem. We all remember Hurricane Harvey 
where there was, I mean, did you ever think you would see white caps on the interstate? There was so much water and there was, no, nobody saw rain like that before. And there have been quite a few studies of this particular storm, right? People used to say, well, we can't attribute any particular storm to climate change. Well, there have been studies of this particular storm that said that the rainfall was tenfold what it, have, what, what it would have been because of human-induced climate change, because of the warmer air, the warmer atmosphere holding more moisture, the warmer water fueling that storm, the higher sea level, so the, so the storm surge was riding on top of that higher sea level, and that additional rain, the compound flooding as the rivers tried to move to the sea and the sea tried to move inland at the same time. So we got a, we got a taste of how serious climate change is. Simple, serious, and you know, it's not just sea level rise, it's having effect, climate change is having effects on our health. And there are lots of ways the, the U.S. Global Change Research Program put together a, a nice assessment of climate change and its health impacts. This particular report that you can get on my website is by a dozen medical societies that have formed a medical consortium on climate and health. You know, there are so many ways that climate's affecting our health, from extreme heat to air quality, fires, extreme weather, uh, increased food and waterborne related illnesses, mosquito and tick-borne diseases, and people's mental health and well-being as they try and survive some of these extreme weather events. And finally, I would like to say on the serious piece that this is really a justice issue. Some of the people who have contributed the least to climate change suffer the most because of it and have the least resources with which to adapt and deal with it. And also young people. We're leaving them this kind of a climate future, and they're not too happy about that. So this, this is a justice issue. It's an intergenerational equity issue. Okay, so I've said it's serious, it's, it's uh, simple, it's serious, and it's solvable. So let's talk about how it's solvable. So I mentioned choice. The future really is our choice. Do we have a future with less emissions and less warming, or one with more emissions and more warming? That's the choice we face. There is global engagement on this issue, and that means that it's solvable to have all the countries of the world get together in Paris and say, we are gonna move in this direction, we're gonna to work together. And even though the US has now said that it's going to pull out from the Paris Agreement, 14 states, more than 300 cities, and more than 1,000 businesses have said, we are still in. We are going to try and meet America's pledge to the Paris Climate Agreement. And so there are still people wanting to, to do something about this, including some of the leaders of this movement, the former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, and the governor of California, Jerry Brown. Now, another reason I say it's solvable is because the price of renewable energy, clean energy, has come down dramatically in recent years solar, wind, batteries, LEDs, this is a very energy efficient lighting technology. These prices have come down so fast and at the same time, installed capacity of clean energy is going up around the world. And it's going up so fast that it's now the majority of new electricity coming online is renewable energy, not fossil fuels. An example of this, Scotland, got 68% of its electricity from renewables last year in 2017. That's pretty major. And they're on track for 100% by 2020, which is just a couple of years away. So we are seeing this happen in some places. China had the biggest growth in renewable energy last year of any country. Now, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And so here are just two examples. The folks in the picture on the left here are from Interfaith Power and Light. Every religion getting together and saying, this is something we care about. This is a moral issue. This is about taking care of the least of these. And this is about taking care of God's creation. And they're working, they, they share sermon ideas. They have a sermon bank. And they preach about climate change from the pulpit. And they're very serious about this issue. And they lobby their members of Congress for climate action. And then on the right, we see some of the young people that are involved in all kinds of activities, including a lawsuit against the government that's been going on now for years. It's 
if you, you can find out more about it at ourchildrenstrust.org. And the young man you see with the microphone is one of the people bringing that suit, saying, we have a right. It's our constitutional right to have a decent climate in our future. So these are some of the things people can do, but everyone can do something. At minimum, we can talk about it more. There's tremendous silence around climate change. People don't talk about it enough. You all talk about it in your classrooms and your students can do something too. So I think we should encourage everyone to do what they can. Something that's happening that youth are organizing is a lobby day. And their website is thisiszerohour.org and they're also going to have a march, and both of those are going to be in July of this year. So I think in the end, when I say it's simple, serious, and solvable, we have to remember that the future lies in our hands. This isn't like one of those things with the dinosaurs where, you know, we're going to get hit by a meteor and it's out of our control. We can do something about this. And so with that, I always say that the best communication is a conversation rather than a lecture. So with that, I would like to stop talking and take your questions and comments and have a conversation. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, Susan. That was great. Sure. Um, let's see. Stop sharing my screen. And I can turn on my video if we want, if you want to be able to see me. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Here I am. There, there you are. All right. So, comments, questions, thoughts? So, as a, uh, I'll, I'll start the conversation here a little bit. This is Tracy. And um, what, what I struggle with as a teacher a little bit is how much we guide our students through this conversation about climate without. Um, feeling like you're you're pontificating to them you know it's like oh this is happening this is happening and i think um one thing that as teachers we struggle with is not to provide the doom and gloom perspective of what's going on and and i was wondering if you could share that a little bit for for us as you know as educators you know how do we play that balance of action and and i i really like the three s's i i wish i i used that in my classroom when i when i taught because i i feel like i was a little bit more of a doom and gloom just to say hey we all got to take action uh and it starts with you guys my students yeah um so you're right i think it's particular i think it's important for everyone to have hope but I think it's especially important for kids to have hope and not to leave them feeling in despair about their future. Because I think that can just cause people to not want to do anything if, if they feel like there's no hope. And this is why I say, you know, we really should never use that inevitability frame, right? This should be about our choice. I also think that it feels less like pontificating if, if you speak, and I don't want to say nonchalantly because it's very serious problem, but sort of calmly, this is what's happening, this is why, we know what's causing it, and there's something we can do about it, right? So it's not hair on fire, you know, kind of going crazy about it. It's saying, this is what's happening, and there's a lot we can do. And here, and in fact, to talk about some of the things that are happening already, I think is very helpful, which is why I frequently talk about, why I showed you the picture about Scotland, and talk about the price of clean energy coming down and how much renewable energy is being installed. People we know from psychology do better when they feel like we're already on our way than if they feel like we're starting from scratch. So when people say things like, oh, we have to remake the entire world's energy system, you know, it makes it feel too big, too impossible. And of course, it is a big challenge. We are talking about reducing emissions, you know, probably 80% by mid-century and, and thereafter to, to zero, and then trying to, in fact, be taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. By the way, I don't like the term negative emissions because it sounds like a bad thing, right? <laughs> but, you know, of course, we know what it means. I gave a, a talk to the IPCC scientists that are working on that 1.5C special report, and I, I put up the negative emissions, and I said, try not to use that term. It's really not helpful. So they heard me, they laughed, and they, they got it. But it'll still be there in the report, don't worry. 
Um, anyway, so I think you raised such an important point, and I do think it's very important to provide students with hope to also, though, I mean, we don't want to be Pollyanna about this. This is a very serious, you know, and there are some very serious impacts that we're seeing even now. And yet, I think the hope thing is really important. And so, I would just stress that. Other other thoughts? And yeah, I think the simple, serious, solvable framework is really nice. I sometimes use a different framework, which is, you know, what some of us call the big five. It's real, it's us, it's urgent, experts agree, and there's hope. And, you know, I sort of walk through those five things that people need to understand. Um, but somehow, like I said, the power of three, <laughs> it's, it's strong. Thank you, Susan. I really like your presentation, and I took a few pictures without waiting for your slides uh, because I really would like to bring them almost like in a few hours to the classroom. <laughs> so oh. thank you, and I like your style of presenting, and it's just very passionate, and um, and I can't wait to see your TED talk, and, and so and really grateful. Um, my two sons. Um, I'm an engineer. Um, in my previous career, career, I'm retired as an engineer, but um, I always talk about um, um, engineering approach, basically, um, and it helps me to really say, okay, in any problems, we have to define, uh, uh, we have to start from defining the problem. You know, that, and it's just really important to really uh, find different solutions, but it starts from defining the problem. So it's not like we're painting a very dark picture. It's just uh, in any area, whatever problems we're dealing with, we have to define it because we need to know uh, what it is that uh, we need to solve. And that really, this, this sort of a practical approach from engineering perspective sometimes helps me, but what do I know? I'm an engineer. <laughs> so, so it's basically, but... For, for someone who dealt with data and engineering all whole life, sometimes I don't want to look into that data because sometimes it's, it's, it's very much concerning. Um, but I'm sure we will develop some, some solution. Yeah, there is no other way to say it. And again, kudos to you, Susan. I really like your presentation. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. And I think that's good advice. You know, they say even like in these 12 step programs, the first step is admitting you have a problem, right? You have to admit that you have a problem, you have to define the problem, and then you can find your solutions. So I think that's the situation we find ourselves in. And if we look at it that way, it's, it's practical, it's straightforward, and, you know, we have to have a can do attitude about it. So, There's Susan, I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, uh, Janet Vale posted a, a question in the chat box. How did you get interested in climate change initially? So I was always interested in um, energy, the environment, and uh, right out of college, I started working in um, the energy field, and I seem to have this knack for absorbing large amounts of information, sort of consolidating it, cutting to the chase, and summarizing it in simple, plain language. And I started doing that in the energy field. And very quickly, working in the energy field, I came to realize that the big implication of our energy use in our energy system was climate change. And this was 30 years ago. So the field was still relatively young. And I started reading everything I could get my hands on, and I started working at the Aspen Global Change Institute. And there I met hundreds and hundreds of scientists that were working on different aspects of climate change. And the first thing I started to do was to try and get them to understand each other, because the people from different disciplines were speaking different languages. They didn't even understand each other. So I started helping them with that, and then I started helping them explain themselves more clearly to policymakers and to the public. And before I knew it, I had launched this career in, you know, synthesizing what we know about the science, because scientists tend to focus in their particular area, and it was difficult to get the whole story in one place. So I was working with the oceanographers and the atmospheric chemists and, 
and then of course the demographers and the you know the economists and I was bringing it all together and talking about it in language that anybody could understand and then I was training scientists and how they could communicate more effectively and that's that's sort of my story and it's been fascinating but it just became clear to me that this was going to be the most important issue of our time and you know as the singer Paul Simon says I just want to say the most important thing there is to say in the most effective way there is to say it. And I want to help everyone else in our field do that too. That's good. We have other questions for Susan. Just a quick comment, if nobody um, asking any questions, I, I sorry, I already said a few words, but uh, here's again, I really would like to encourage you, Susan, to use your talent and expertise to talk to our legislators because they, I think, sometimes need, need to really hear that. <laughs> so, because uh, it's just very important for us to educate those policymakers, uh, really translate it into, um, from the scientific language to sort of um, more more general language that could uh, be really uh, understood uh, a little bit more easier easily. Thank you. Yeah, J Jackie posted a question. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure what she was meaning. What do you see as the biggest unnoticed air issue? I'm not sure what that means, Jackie. Can I jump in, Kevin? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I I think Tracy hit it best when um, she started that conversation. I'm kind of in the same boat, you know, avoiding doom and gloom when you talk about this and just trying to find a positive way to discuss this this big issue, you know. Um, one of the things, and I, I'm just throwing an idea out there, the, the Gibraltar School District where I work at, work at we have um, an energy czar. Um, we have somebody that comes in the building and he, you know, uh, walks classroom to classroom at the end of the day and he makes sure, you know, certain things are, are turned off. And I mean, we, I guess we're saving significant amount of money by having this because this individual we we pay him so we have to offset that cost and as far as you know what i've i've heard is it's it's saved us considerable money now me i'm, I'm pretty bad like my room has a, a, a you know two fish tanks one has a salmon chiller on it which runs all day long i have grow lamps on a wall like three massive lights i have a smap oven that runs non-stop I, I i suck a lot of juice in my room but you know, those are sacred, but as far as everybody else goes, um, I, I think we've cut down, you know, pretty significant. I don't think you have to have an energy czar to do this. It's just maybe a stipend or something like that to have one person in your building be the, the, the energy guru, you know, to, to save you some money. Well, what I would what I would suggest is that you let that be the kid's job, right? Somebody was saying in the chat that let's give the kids something that they can do, right? I think it would be perfect to make that the kid's job. Let's look for ways that we can save energy and, you know, make it fun. Say like, you know, there's this thing called vampire loads. That's the things that are sucking electricity even when they're not on, right? Because their their chargers are still plugged in, right? The, the television that's plugged in and is staying warmed up all the time. So put everything on a power strip and switch off the power strip so that everything gets turned off and it's not sucking juice. But let that be the kid's job to figure out where are our vampire loads? What can we turn off? And, and let them and then and make it a math problem too. let them figure out how much energy they're saving how much money they're saving how many what's the carbon emission savings for every one of those things that they do so this seems to me like a good answer to a bunch of the things we're talking about finding yeah. something that kids can do that they can take responsibility for that can save you money and energy and carbon emissions and this is one of the things that I think is so helpful when you're talking about climate solutions is to say you know what we would do these things even if it weren't for climate change because they save us money and they make our air cleaner. And there's good reasons to do these things even if there weren't a climate problem. 
So it's that multiple, you know, multi-solving kind of thing that I think is really useful. So I, I had a student, um, I'm sorry. I, I, I had a student a few years ago that actually suggested, he said, you know, Mr. Bauman, we have to keep the salmon tank at 48 degrees. Um, why don't we just turn down, you know, the heat in the classroom and we just start wearing hoodies to school and, and you know, we can, we can, I was like, bingo, man, that's, that's awesome. So yeah, just like Dr. Kevin's doing right there. You know, so my room has is, is been a cold room in the building for, for a while. And I thought it was the coolest thing a few years back that a kid actually suggested that. And, um, you know, I bring that up every year right before um, we, we get the, the salmon eggs. And, and my thing is, do you want to hear the chiller run all day long and that constant hum? Or do you want to keep this tank nice and, and cold and, and the chiller shuts off? I, I don't have anything else. I was just, you know, sharing some ideas. Thank you for your presentation tonight. It was really good. So thank you. Thank you. I know, like, you know, everybody's house is, as well. You can, of course, um, uh, reduce electric use or energy use. And I know for our house, we got a geothermal system a few years ago. And then, uh, you know, the LED light bulbs. And, you know, we don't keep it the hottest in the winter, wear our hoodies. And, uh, you know, but it, it helps because I don't want to pay the bill. <laughs> so, you know, appealing to people's economic interests is, is sometimes helpful. Um, I was wondering or thinking about, as you're talking, Susan, uh, you know, the auto industry in the 80s, uh, at the time, Japanese cars were being made better than the U.S. cars. And people started buying Japanese cars. And, you know, and the auto industry in the United States started having a lot of problems. And I remember even my dad worked for the auto industry. Uh, everybody said, well, we can't change and we can't do anything. But, but then the auto industry did change, didn't they? And they, they're much, uh, well, the cars are much better made now. Of course, you know, they're burning fossil fuels. <laughs> but um, there, you know, people buy American cars, American made uh, as much now as uh, Japanese and other cars. So that's one thing I, I was wondering about, like appealing to people's economic senses that, you know, if, if other countries are beating us in the renewable energy race, we're falling behind in the technology and we're not being a leader. And we've, we've been a leader for a long time. I always say that. I always say this is about uh, competition and innovation and ingenuity and, you know, American exceptionalism. You want to be great. You want to be a leader. So, yeah, if you listen to my TED Talk, you'll hear me talk about all of that and about competing in the clean energy race. So I think you're exactly right. And since we were talking a little bit, I see that somebody has their uh, students do classroom energy audit, which is wonderful. Um, I was going to suggest that there's a group in Kansas that's run by a woman named Nancy Jackson, and um, it's called the Climate and Energy Project. And one of the things that they do is the schools compete with each other to see which one can save more energy. And the, one that, the, the school that saves the most energy gets a prize. So you can do stuff like that. You can have classes competing against each other, schools competing against each other. And you know, once students start doing it at school, maybe they'll go home and one of their assignments can be to do an energy audit in their home and to look for ways to save energy at home. And as we all know, you know, it was kids who taught their parents how to recycle then, you know, a couple of generations ago. So kids can, can be teaching their parents about these kinds of things. So I th think you're exactly right about the economic motivation. I think it's also uh, healthy competition will be great for the students as a way of learning. And, you know, we even know there's some psychology behind this and there's a, a company called Opower. We know that if you tell people on their electricity bill how they're doing compared to their neighbors, that that actually helps people. That's like this healthy keeping up with the Joneses, right? You know, wanting to, you know, how does it, are you saving more energy than your efficient neighbors and that kind of thing? So I think those are all, all great ideas. So I think we're probably at the end of the time that we allotted for this, but uh, I'll let you decide when we're done and, and wrap us up. Well, I guess it's, it's a good time to uh, wrap up she's going to watch your ted talk 
uh, and DTE does also, uh, yeah, you, you could do um, audits. It's a good, nice thing. Okay, so let me just share my screen again. Um, now, we, we had planned a student follow-up on Friday. Does that sound right, Susan? Not with me. Oh, yeah, okay. I, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the reins on that, Kevin. Okay, so, oh, okay, so Tracy, you're doing it. Right. Okay, cool. All right, so, um, you know, teachers who want their kids to call in at 1 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, there's the uh, tiny URL uh, for the webinar. And if you could post in the chat box if you're thinking of having your kids uh, call in um, during that, uh, that would be very helpful to us to get a, a sense of how many people might call in. Uh, our next, also I mentioned our next webinar uh, will be May 1st, 8 o'clock. Uh, Boston University, uh, Peter is on the line right now. Uh, they're going to be talking about their, um, oh, I can't read it because my eyes are too bad. Uh, going green, globe going green, it's their uh, phenological garden uh, at, that they have at schools and talking about how that's going. Of course, uh, me with the cold weather, it's not doing a whole lot, <laughs> but uh, we can hear, hear about their phenological gardens. And then uh, just to follow up on, uh, we have our satellites uh, conference at the University of Toledo. Uh, tomorrow is the registration deadline. There's a SurveyMonkey link. Uh, you've got, for those of you who are around, you probably have uh, gotten these links. Uh, and then uh, just to remind you, we have uh, the deadlines approaching for uh, the symposia. Uh, let's see, Midwest, the deadline's April 18th, Pacific, April 18th. Uh, May 1st for the Northwest, all right, and then, uh, well, let's see, this is a shameless plugging. We have our, uh, at the University of Toledo, uh, career technical education teachers can come learn about uh, geospatial technologies using kites and drones to image the Earth and then linking that to globe observations. And then here's our credits. You could uh, follow us on, uh, well, we have a website on the GLOBE website, uh, Web Mission Earth, and then Facebook, GLOBE Mission Earth. You just type in the uh, search, as well as for YouTube, GLOBE Mission Earth, because that, that's what it comes up. And all the webinars are archived on the YouTube channel. All right, so I'll stop sharing. I appreciate everybody calling in today. Uh, um, see, we have some people maybe and Jan saying, please register. All right, everybody, thanks for calling in. Susan, thanks for a great job. Yeah, Tracy, thank you so thanks much, for Susan. organizing it. Thank My you pleasure. All. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Susan. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night.